Now in for review today, we've got Microsoft Surface Pro 11 for business. This comes months after Microsoft released the consumer range of Surface Pro 11 using the ARM Snapdragon chipset. Now we love the Surface Pro 11 and the ARM CPU was a great performer, but Microsoft totally overpromised the ARM version of Windows. And even now there are gaps in software and games that the emulation software just cannot run or run so poorly that you'd be desperate for an x86 system to get your work done. Now don't get me wrong, if all your software runs on the ARM version of Windows, you're in for a good time. It offered amazing battery life, good native performance and cool running. But still there's sadly plenty of software that I can't run six months later. So here comes the Surface Pro 11 for business in the more traditional x86 using Intel's new CPU range, which offers much better battery life than usual Intel chips. It offers better temps and fan noise, but it comes at a price. Firstly, these are expensive devices. And secondly, we're gonna lose some CPU performance to make all this possible. But we're gonna look at that later in the performance section. Now the model that we're looking at today is the higher end model with the Intel Core Ultra 7 268V. It's got 32 gigabytes of RAM, a 256 gig SSD, and this beautiful OLED display. This comes at an insane price of 2,079 pounds in the UK. Now the base model, that comes in at 1,479 pounds, but for that you get only an i5 CPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and you lose that beautiful OLED display and get the older IPS panel. And don't forget with the Surface Pro, the pen and keyboard are not included. So if you don't have any previous Surface products from the range eight or above, you're looking at another $200 just to get the package up and running. Now fortunately, I still have my trusty Surface Pro 8 and the keyboard and pen that I bought with that device still work perfectly on this new model. Now with regards to the chassis design, it's exactly the same as the consumer ARM model. So I'm gonna link that video down below just in case you're interested. But in summary, just for this video here, the Surface Pro 11 is a well-built two-in-one with a solid kickstand that allows the device to travel all the way back making it great for design, drawing, or just office work and media creation and consumption. Now on the left, we have two Thunderbolt 4 ports. And then on the right, we've got the usual surface magnetic charging port. Along the top, we have the power button and then the volume control rocker. And then lastly, under the kickstand, we've got this little magnetic hatch and that covers the 30 millimeter SSD, which allows for quick drive upgrades. Now looking at this OLED screen is a joy to behold. This 13 inch pixel sense display has a 2880 by 1920 pixel resolution, giving it a three by two aspect ratio. It's perfect for work. It's also very bright and being OLED has stunning colors and deep blacks. Plus it's 120 Hertz touch and pen enabled and covered with Gorilla Glass 5 to protect it. And one difference for the business model over the consumer model is that this business model gets a very slight anti-glare coating. And I really appreciate that as the consumer models are like a mirror and very difficult to use in bright environments. Now the anti-glare on these models is very subtle, but it does help when you're using it out and about in bright environments or outside. Now to the top left and right of the screen, we've got forward firing speakers and they sound like this. This is a test of the speakers on the Surface Pro 11 for business, the Intel edition, uh, starting at 50% volume. Now 80%. And then finally 100% volume. They're actually, although not the loudest speakers in the world, they're actually pretty good firing straight at you. They sound pretty impressive when you're in front of the machine. Then above the screen, we get a quad HD camera and it looks and sounds like this. This is a test of the webcams and the microphones on the new Surface Pro 11 for business. This is the Intel 268V edition. Uh, the webcam looks pretty clear from my perspective. Let me know what it looks and sounds like to you. We also get the excellent Windows Hello facial recognition for speedy logins. And I've always found that these Surface devices facial recognition works incredibly well. And being a two-in-one device, we also get a rear 10 megapixels camera which although won't win any awards is very handy to have. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very compact two-in-one device. It's nice and solid feeling, and it's not too heavy to hold, though it certainly isn't as light as an iPad. 
So the Surface Pro 11 without the keyboard and pen comes in at 879 grams. So that isn't bad if you're holding it without the keyboard and mouse and using it as a tablet. It's certainly not that comfortable though, because although it is curved, it does dig into your palms a little bit. But personally, I think most people are gonna just use it with the kickstand, which is what I think most of these Surface Pros are actually great at, especially if you wanna use it for drawing and you put it at a really nice incline. Also, Windows 11 isn't great for use as a tablet, but it can be done in a pinch. Now, with regards to the keyboard, I'm still gonna be using my old Surface Pro keyboard and pen, which has held up amazingly well with a couple of years that I've used it with my Surface Pro 8. I only use it lightly out in the field and I use a mechanical when I'm in my office, so it does look excellent still. Now, this Surface Pro 8 keyboard, although it's not as great as a dedicated keyboard, the typing experience is still very good with it. There's a little bit of bounce being that it is obviously a material keyboard, but it feels lovely under your wrist. It's got a backlit keyboard and the touchpad, although small, works really well in a pinch. We get an old fashioned style, small springboard trackpad, but it works perfectly well. Also, if we bring the keyboard forward and lay it flat on the desk, we then get access to the pen in this little well. The pen is held in magnetically and charged and when you lift it out, it does give you access to your commonly used apps with the pen. Obviously, this is fantastic for taking notes and drawing on the go, and one of the big reasons people buy a Surface Pro. And if you're feeling incredibly rich, you can also buy the new Flex Surface Keyboard, which adds a larger haptic touchpad and a wireless function for that entire keyboard area, so you can use it away from the Surface Pro, unlike this model, which always needs to be connected to be used. But you will need to be stumping up £340 for the pleasure. So there's our whistle-stop tour of the physical device out of the way, and now let's look at performance. And we're gonna start with the CPU. And this Core Ultra 7 268V is an eight core CPU with four performance cores and four efficiency cores. It can boost up to five gigahertz on those performance cores, which leads to very snappy single core performance, such as opening apps and web browsing. And you can see those scores in Geekbench 6 on the single core results look very impressive. Sadly, things don't look as great in the multi-core performance, thanks to its limited number of cores and lack of hyper-threading. Now, don't get me wrong, for a mobile device like this, the multi-core performance is fine, but when you compare it against the mobile Ryzen chips or even the Snapdragon, it loses easily. Now, the upside of this very average CPU performance is that the temps and the fan noise of using these devices is much better, and my day-to-day -day use of this Surface Pro has been fantastic. I rarely hear the fan spin up unless I'm really pushing the system. Now running some benchmarks of Citibench R24, I get a maximum fan noise of 37 decibels on the performance profile. That's really quite impressive. Now you can also use those Windows Power Profiles to adjust the performance and noise of this device. Then moving it over to the GPU, and this is an area where Intel has really made strides. No longer are we using the really poor Iris graphics. We are now treated to the new Arc onboard GPUs in these Intel chips, and they are a big step up in every way. Looking at 3D benchmarks, you can see just how well this model performs against the Snapdragon and the Ryzen integrated graphics. Obviously, we've excluded the Ryzen Halo chips from here as a completely different class of processor. And this graphics can even handle some gaming pretty effectively, which is one of the biggest gripes of the ARM version of this Surface Pro. Now, yes, I know you don't buy a Surface Pro to game on, but it's great being able to kick back at the end of a long, hard day with a few games of Apex or the finals when I've finished all my work. Now in either the performance mode or the balance mode, the system managed to maintain about 26 watts and peaks at about 30 watts in my long game sessions. And it does so with the fan noise only maxing up to about 40 decibels. So overall, I'm incredibly impressed with just how well this device can game. And if this laptop can game, you know it can handle creativity workloads very well. And in my testing of Photoshop and Blender, performance was really impressive. And it even managed my 4K60 10-bit video edits in DaVinci Resolve something that my mobile Ryzen chips really struggle with, and the Snapdragon ARM version of this was a slideshow if it didn't crash. For the first time, this Surface Pro can handle my entire daily workflow. Now, don't get me wrong, I won't be swapping my editing desktop for this Surface Pro, but I'd happily use this device on the go for quick edits. Talking of on the go, these new Intel chips are much more efficient, which does mean better battery life. Now this has always been the Achilles heel on Windows laptops, especially against Apple Silicon. Now Intel is making great progress here and completing our usual battery test of web browsing over Wi-Fi at 200 nits of brightness in the best efficiency mode. This two-in-one managed 11 hours and 11 minutes of battery life. Now I expect if you buy the IPS version, you're gonna get even more battery life than the OLED version. 
Now this isn't quite as good as the ARM Surface Pro 11, which managed 13 hours and 40 minutes, but considering Intel's usual battery life numbers, this is a big step in the right direction. Also performance on battery was excellent. On the best efficiency mode, benchmark scores show a bit of a reduction in performance, but using the device for office work and web browsing felt absolutely fine. Switching it to balance, we got performance similar to being on mains, at the expense of a little battery life, and I'd recommend that most users keep it in that balance mode unless you know you can be away from the outlet for a long time. And keeping this charged, you can use the supplied Surface Connect magnetic power adapter. It's really compact, and I love that if someone trips over that cable, it's gonna pull out the Surface Pro rather than rip it off the table. But you can also charge it via the Thunderbolt 4 ports with a power supply, power bank, docks, or PD monitors. I personally hooked mine up to my Dell Ultrafine monitor, which has a 90 watt PD charging, USB hub, and Ethernet port, all built into a beautiful 27 inch 4K display. Overall, this is now a very solid device, and in my humble opinion, a much better option over the Snapdragon, if you can stomach that price. Now in the UK, although it's difficult to buy in retail channels, there are a few retailers stocking it at much keener pricing than on the Microsoft's websites, and you can still pick up the Snapdragon version for hundreds less. So if you are set on buying a Surface Pro for its 2-1 capabilities and all your software is ARM compatible, it may be worth considering the Snapdragon version over the actual Intel. But if you're a heavy user and you've got deep pockets, then in my opinion this is a much more robust option, and I would certainly much prefer this Intel version than the Snapdragon. So there are my thoughts on the Surface Pro 11 for business. It's a fantastic device, but wow is it expensive. As always, I'd love to know what you guys think. Pop your comments down below and I will get back to you. And lastly, thank you for watching.